amazing transformation. And a key piece of what some of these new entrepreneurs have done is they've broken or violated a rule of the old business model assumptions. Mm. So Jimmy Whale says we're going to create an encyclopedia for free. It's just going to be open for free for everybody. And that, there's not necessarily going to be a business model behind it, and that appears to work. And Craig Newmark says, I'm not going to suck all the margin out of all these industries that I'm sort of you know, doing something to. I'm just not going to try to absorb all that margin. Now, Google, on the other hand, despite all their attempts to not be evil, does a brilliant job of sucking all the margin out of the transactions that they're in. Mm. Their auction scheme is a very perfect way of getting Google a ton of money and still making everybody pretty happy, right? So Google's a different thing. But, but we're, we're seeing, in some sense, violations of common assumptions of what you might call gentlemanly traditional business courtesy, like, of course you're going to try to maximize profits, and then we'll try to buy you, and then you'll have an IPO. Well, guess what? Craig doesn't want to have an IPO. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right? The it's last not, thing he'd not be interested in. <laughs> just not on his radar for doing. And he charges a few people for a few things in Craigslist, and that creates enough money that it funds a foundation, plus his staff and, and servers, funds a foundation that pours money into other things. That's pretty awesome. Well, in the Google thing, it, it, it has an interesting aspect in that, I mean, advertising was such a blunderbuss, scattershot kind of business. I right. mean, the old John Wanamaker, I know half my money on ads is wasted, I just don't know which half. And Google had a way to have some measurable impact and tie it back and make it a more rational deal. So yeah. maybe they uh, are a little greedy in the way they did it, but I, I think they've cut out a lot of nonsense that we used to have at the well, same time. They also cut out the big flashy ads that were, you know, taking half of your screen. The reason I never ever used Yahoo Mail or Hotmail is that half your screen was a picture that was trying to move around to appeal yeah. to the limbic system, you know, your frog brain, so that you'd go look at it and buy something. And, and Google at least said, well, look, we're, g we're going to put ads here, but they're going to be little text they're ads subtle. on the side, and they're going to be contextual given what you're trying to do. Yeah. So that, that was pretty cool. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny with the uh, Wikipedia example, that about the same time you have Encarta start up with the backing of a very aggressive deep pockets uh, at the time, ultimate high tech company. And I mean, that sucker's closed. You'd think they'd have at least maintained it, they would have something, but just no, no contest at all, all gone. So I had a really interesting experience back then. Um, I, I was writing Esther Dyson's newsletter, Release 1.0, out of Manhattan. And I had two briefings within about two or three months of each other. One was with Encarta at Microsoft, and one was with MSNBC, which was brand new, mm. sort of the new news mm. network, right? Microsoft and NBC joint venture, MSNBC. So I go to the Encarta meeting, and it's in the Pierre Hotel. There are five staffers and one PR person in the room. There's a PC on the desk. This is before the days of broadband. We're in dial-up. So they dial up, they log in, and effectively all they do is they play a piece of the DVD of the, of the CD-ROM at the time for me in a browser window. And they, they go to the page, I think, on New York City. And I look at it, and I look at them, and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, really? Are they kidding? So then I say, well, this is a, this, you're showing me the page for New York City. Why don't you connect this to New York City? Why, mm. isn't, why isn't there a webcam? And this is in the days when webcams were really hot. Yeah. Like, they, you had, they were open webcams. You could go see birds roosting on buildings. You could go see all kinds of stuff uh, before the days of chat roulette. Um, it, why, why don't you just connect this to the city? So that, that, that was one thing there. Then I had this briefing with MSNBC where I learned that they're doing the news and they're starting to build widgets for the website. And one widget that I remember from then was a, jo a little Java map of the U.S. that had little pinpoints where uh, church burnings had happened. And if you clicked on the pinpoints, you could see how, you know, property damage, how many people were hurt. Wow. And it was, it was for one news article, right? And, I, and, I, and first I learned that they weren't at that time archiving the stories. So nothing was staying in memory. But then the widget they had just built that was a map that had pins in it, they weren't keeping it and feeding maybe the encyclopedia? Mm. Like, you got y'all own Encarta. There's an encyclopedia that needs to know about the world. There are going to be these basic widgets that are going to be about how do we put pins in a map, right? Why don't you just connect those things up and start sharing data and do that? And, and there was just no, there, that wasn't anywhere in their brain to yeah. see or to do. Yeah. It was really interesting. So, so it, <laughs> that explains a lot to me about Microsoft's sort of approach to the, to the market back then and their understanding of this 21st century mechanism. Yeah, well, of course, uh, the, the one that really imploded 
I mean, I remember when people would spend a fortune to have Encyclopedia Britannica because the kids' brains need to be fed, and this was the authoritative thing. And mm -hmm. a friend of mine did an interview with Encyclopedia Britannica. It was going to be for a Wired story. And they were just totally, they, they were unbelievers. They could not imagine that there was any threat out there. Wow. And they, you know, went, of course, later when they did try to monetize things, they said, oh, well, ours costs a lot of money and this other stuff is free or near free. So that didn't work. Um, but it was the innovator's dilemma. Mm -hmm. They thought, oh, this, this stuff's got mistakes. It'll never be there without understanding, oh, hold it, with crowdsourcing, all mistakes are shallow and go away. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> Just flew right past them. Mm. And the fact that even the canonical version of the present, their, the real encyclopedia, had mistakes. And that even as we learned in science what was right and what was wrong, it didn't make its way into the encyclopedia fast enough, for example. But there were other things that were just mistakes. Well, I remember a time when, when the arguments were still ranging, raging of, oh, well, Wikipedia versus Britannica, which is a more accurate? Mm -hmm. And they sort of missed the fact that, well, I was at your house, and Joe Lieberman won a primary, and we went on to Wikipedia to check out something about Lieberman, and it was already announced that he won the, the primary in that article. Mm -hmm. And Britannica hadn't been printed since Lieberman had come on the scene at all, so they had nothing. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in current information, it was the only game in town, Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I never understood why that didn't come out in the comparisons. When the current pope was made pope, I, rem I remember Jimmy Wales gave a talk and I went and listened to it. And in the middle of the, the speech, he, he said, you know, here's a funny thing. Um, after Ratzinger was made uh, made Pope, I got a lot of congratulatory emails from journalists and other people, and they said, wow, we, s we saw that there was a complete page for the Pope up, like, immediately. It was done. You know, that's awesome. The Wikipedia's really cool. And he laughs, and he goes, well, we had a page for all the cardinals. Like, <laughs> all, all their bios were already up. It's called, add a new paragraph, retitle the page, and we're done. <laughs> We're done, <laughs> right? Because the news just rolls, and it, the context existed. It w there was like a rich context that they could just modify, and that was still news. Yeah, yeah, boy, it's lovely. It, it just it, it, these these sort of ways that we've seen the world historically that are historical artifacts. Clay Shirky says this really well. He says that n the newspaper business model was a fluke of history. The fact that ads and this and that all, all came together to, to fuel a news business. In fact. I don't know that he goes much into it, but objective journalism was invented by Arthur Oakes sort of as part of the New York Times. Before that, there was yellow journalism, and there was also mostly journalism was political, mm -hmm. very strongly skewed. Um, so all these things are, are recent and temporary. All right. Well, I'm, I'm a total optimist about the way this is going. I know some people are horrified, but uh, isn't it wonderful that 1984 didn't turn out like that? Man. <laughs> And uh, it seems to be getting more open and just more challenging if we can uh, sort of stay on top of a few things as we go forward. I, I, think, I think we fear chaos. We fear falling into chaos. And here, like, I mean, the big we, all cultures, all societies, we really fear chaos. Therefore, and we have some assumptions about human nature, mostly we assume that humans are kind of, they're going to chap you if they can. They're not really very trustworthy. So we build institutions everywhere that have that as the working assumption, and we go out and we, we live in them and we take them for granted, right? And I actually think that a completely different world is possible and is right now being invented before our very eyes. This is the moment when these things are being experimented with and prototyped, and in fact, we're seeing that they're working and we're learning those lessons. However, there was a really clever article a couple months back that said, are we going into Orwell's future or into Huxley's future? Mm. Are we going to be managed to death, basically restricted and, and, and confined, or are we going to be entertained to death? And mm. both of those things are, in fact, also happening. Those two futures are, in fact, playing out as, as both of those authors would have probably hideously sort of shrieked and giggled thinking about it because th they're playing out right now. The movie WALL-E with all of us shrinking in our skeletons and you know, being entertained to death, that, that's a vision of that future happening right now so the question really is over what time frame and, and is it over 50 years 100 years 500 years or a thousand years that these how do these forces duke it out going forward 
which will mean that our, our kids or grandkids may or may not have the kind of world that you and I just talked about and, are, and I think are generally optimistic about. Um, but we can't be too naive about all this other activity that's going on in the world and inertia, like people's yeah. unwillingness to, to believe yeah. things and to jump into um, things wholesale. Well, when I work with corporations and there's this fear of sort of, well, what happens if we take the clamps off and we let people to my mind, be all that they can be, but give them the, the freedom to act. And people, well, how do you control that? And I think, no, no, wrong, wrong take on things entirely. You don't control that. But if you have high expectations of people, generally they live up to them. Right. And conversely, if as you see in the sort of stamp your time card, just do your job culture, you have low expectations of people, they will live down to them. Totally. <laughs> Totally. And, and if you treat uh, people like children, they'll act like children. Yeah, yeah. So I, Pretty I, much. I, I view the role of, well, the, they still have the title of manager, even though the, the job is shifting to more of facilitation, coordination, mm -hmm. inspirational leader. Coaching. But I see that as having high expectations and then feeding back when people live up to them. Right. And it's, uh, boy, it's a lot different than <laughs> what I learned in school, I'll say that. Yeah, and I, I wonder whether and how schools are keeping up, catching up. Because um, with everything accelerating, it takes, you know, curriculum development, testing, vetting, whatever. There's, there's some kind of lag there from getting things in place and actually just teaching it. it and you and I both know a whole bunch of people who are just teaching the now. Yeah. But they're not in, mostly, in the big institutions, right? They're, they're doing things outside. But the institutions need to catch up with this and need to make a pretty dramatic shift as well. Just as for you, the word consumer is bad and is a touchstone to a lot of things that shouldn't happen. Yeah. I treat the word curriculum mm -hmm. in very similar fashion. Mm -hmm. With a capital it, C. It sort of predefined, here's your dose, take it, rather than, well, let's sort of work together to figure things out and co-creation and right. social learning and this sort of thing. So. And the optimistic way of thinking of curriculum with a capital C, the best light I can throw on it, is that it's the best people's brains of the time giving the best possible way to learn a body of work. That, that's like the, my most yeah. optimistic take on it. But it's really easy to step over the line and see the dark side of it, which is curriculum is a way of keeping you from learning the stuff we don't want you to learn. Exactly, right? exactly. And I, I think it's got a role if, if somebody is the tabula rasa and they don't know the language, the context, the framework. I mean, I, I, when I'm talking with folks about informal learning, I so I, you know, I don't counsel you to try to learn algebra from scratch, just sit standing around a water cooler. Ain't mm -hmm. gonna happen that way. Mm -hmm. So you need a curriculum for that. But then after you've got some of it down, well, let's go out and try some things and stretch it a little bit and mm -hmm. talk with our friends about how we might use this for practical application. And put it and, to work. Uh, yeah. Well, that's a whole nother conversation. Exactly. So we're, we're violating our rule about short doses. Yeah. And, uh, maybe you'll see this. Broken up into in, snippets. In snippets. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you very much. Awesome.